Go in there. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu rabbi wa salamuhu wa rahmatuhu wa barakatuhu ala dhaka al-nabi al-kareem nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ba'idhum It's more than I know seven more Thumma amma ba'idhum Continue the chapter Kitab al-Nikah by the great illustrious Imam Al-Hafiz Ahmed bin Ali ibn Ahmed al-Asqalani rahimahullah المتوفى سنة ثمانية مئة واثنين وخمسين أحمد بن علي بن حج العسقلاني ودعا 852 عبد الهجرة والمصطفى عليه الصلاة والسلام and we continue in the, in the chapter of باب الكفاءة والخيار the chapter of adequacy or the chapter of adequacy alternative in Nikah. We finished the hadith of actually we almost closed in finishing or we, we approximately ended the explanation of the benefits we extracted from the hadith of Barira and what happened with her husband Mughif. As we talked about that tremendous hadith which the Prophet nullified and he shot but he conditioned that opposes the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is a condition that is what is, is rejected. It is not regarded, nor is it something considered. Can they close it? I was going to say close it at the heat up. As you know, the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he alayhi salatu as sallam has said, "Kullu shalta fi kitab Allah, wa huwa baatil." فقضاء الله أحق والشرط لا أوثق إنما الولاء لمن أعتق وكما أخبر بذلك الصادق المسلوق عليه الصلاة والسلام في حديث بريرة when like we said just to go back a little bit so we can be on one page this has been a couple of weeks since we had class if you notice in the حديث بريرة رضي الله عنها what happened with her husband مغيث but before talked about the story of what happened with her husband Mughith. We know that Barira was a concubine. She was a concubine and she wanted her liberation for her to be free. And we talked about that a matter which is called in the Shara' in the Kitab al Sunnah, there's a matter called al Mukatala. Al Mukatala, in which is from the affairs of which the goals of the Shara' to get the Kitab and Sunnah is for everyone to have their freedom. And that's why you'll find in a lot of ayat in the Book of Allah, Jalla Jalalu, that Allah Ta'ala says as a expiation or recompense for something of the matters pertaining to Siyam, if one was to transgress and fall into something of an impermissible matter, that nullify his siyal. Notice that it says about the matter. So they probably hear my line, all the kids jumping around and screaming. Where it says in the matter, where it says, فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَ To liberate a slave or to liberate a kakima. You'll find that in many different ayats in the Book of Allah, to bring the other, so many different places. It's not just in one, it's in a lot of them. Just to let you know that the ultimate goal is for everyone to attain and have their freedom and not to be under the matter of al-liq, or what they call slavery. We talked about that Barira was a concubine and she wanted her freedom, so she wanted to actualize the matter what they call al-katiba. There's an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we talked about before where he says, فَكَاتِبُوهُمْ إِنَّ عَلَمْ فَكَاتِبُوهُمْ إِنَّ عَلَمْ تَفِيهِمْ خَيْرًا Meaning, give them that mukataba if you know what they have been in them. That mukataba, like we said, is what Burira had performed with her awliya, those who were in charge of her matters, and she was under their authority from, from her family. But she saved up that money and she went to Aisha radiallahu anha, as it says in the hadith. When she went to Aisha to aid her. Meaning, she asked Aisha to aid her in the matter of 
Kataba what she requested from her, that money. Well, Aisha had agreed to give the rest so she could attain her freedom and she could actually basically purchase her liberation so she could be free. However, the family had what? The family had disagreed and said, even though we free you, we still want to keep the wala. We want to keep the matter of what they call wala, meaning the inscription of her being the free slave to that family. They wanted to keep it due to the due to the affair of inheritance. What happens is if you go back, we don't live in these days and times, but if more than likely, and it probably more than likely is when we go back to those days one day, that if a person is a slave and is requesting his freedom, of course you'll notice from the different tabi'in of the scholars in the past, notice it said, for example, Nafi' Nafi' Mawla Ibn Umar Nafi' Mawla Ibn Umar The free slave of Ibn Umar Tayyip Al-Wala The matter of Wala You have to realize What also coincides with the matter of a person Having that wilaya or that Wala Is matters of inheritance Matters of inheritance also likewise takes takes course and takes into play in these matters. So if a person or the slave was to purchase their freedom, well, likewise the one who, let's just say for example the family, they let her go and the slave was what? Moved to now the jurisdiction of another person for example. Just listen. The wala goes from that family to the other people. To the other people who's over that slaves or that concubines affair. The family can't keep now the actual what they call wala. They can't keep it. Once it's been moved, as once a person purchases their freedom or they move it to another person, let me start over again so I can make it clear. What happened with Aisha radiallahu anha? Barira wanted to purchase herself and free herself from her family. A pound of, of how much money? About 360 dirhams. So she came to Aisha seeking her help. So, Tatabu min her ma'una ta'id. Aisha wanted to aid Barira because she requested from her to aid her in this matter. So, this is what Aisha said. She said, If your family wants, you know, who's under your authority, who's taking care of your affairs, to prepare for them these dirahim, I'll set it up. I'll pay the money. I'll give the money to you to give to the family. So, all right. So after that, when you give them the money to the family, once the money is in their possession, Aisha now she has the what? She has the authority now. She she aided Barira by giving her the rest of the money so she could get her freedom. The wala now once she gives. Now, Barira gave it to those who are in charge of her family. So now Barira, well, she gave the money to her family, and now the actual mukataba, the, the contract is settled, then the actual, the actual, uh, if you want to say ownership, it was moved to now to Aisha, temporarily. So not only does Barira move to now the ownership of Aisha, also the wada moves to Aisha also. The family wanted, no, we want the money, but still we want to keep the wala. You understand now? We want to keep the wala. So that's when the Prophet ﷺ heard that and said, and he became irritated when he heard it. That's when he gave the speech. And he said, he says, مَا بَعْدُ أَقْوَامٍ يَشْتَبِطُونَ شُرُوطًا لَيْسَ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ كل شرط ليس في كتاب الله هو باطل. He says wrong with a certain people that they make conditions. It's not in the book of Allah. Every shalt that's not in the book of Allah, meaning that opposes the book of Allah, of course. That it is what false and it's rejected. Verily, even if it's a hundred conditions, for verily the proclaimment or the determination of Allah is more truthful. Is the most truthful. Excuse me. And the condition of, of Allah is more binding. 
Verily, the wala belongs to the one who liberates, who sets the slave free. Sets the slave free. You understand, everyone? Is it clear now? He says, Verily, the wala belongs to the one who what? liberates and sets the slave free. Five. When Barira was freed, and this is the point of why the great Imam, Al Imam Al Hafiz al Hajj, put it in the chapter. When he liberated Barira, radiallahu anha, she became what? Hur. She became liberated. However, her husband was still a what? He was still asleep. He was still a abd. So, we talked about last lesson, so we don't want to spend too much time on this. But we said last lesson what happened with Rira and her husband. She became free. He remained a slave. So now, is it binding upon her to stay with the, the husband who this is his state where he's still a slave? We said that it goes back to the choice of the woman. She could either what? Stay with him, or she could request, request fasr, the dissolvement or the annulment of the marriage contract. So she has the choice. She can either stay with him, or she can request the fasr for dissolvement of the marriage contract. If we, if we was in Islamic, of course, Islamic city, Islamic state, excuse me, or Islamic country. No, I don't want to confuse with ISIS. If we was in an Islamic country, then we would go to the country of the Hakim, or the one who's the Hakim Shari, who's the judge, who's Islamic judge. And the woman can put in for a request to have her marriage annulled, and the judge would annul it. And he would what? He would dissolve the marriage contract without the permission of the husband. Due to the fact that we said in this hadith, she had the alternative, due to the fact that she became higher as far as in that aspect of her being hope, of being liberated, and her husband was still a what? Still a slave. To the point where, where Barira anha, had actually requested her what? Her freedom. And she wanted her freedom, and she did not even want to stay with her husband, Rahif. She didn't want to stay with him. To the point that we talked about last lesson. As it says in the hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu when Barira, uh, when Mughith came to him, he was in tears. He was in tears because he loved her. So he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asking to aid him in trying to resolve this situation between her, Barira, and, and, and Mughith. So when he went with Mughith to one of the, the roads in Medina and he approached Barira, he says, do you not look to your husband? And basically, he loves you. And this is show you, Ma'ashid Ikhwa, that the Prophet ﷺ was a very humble man. That he was very, very humble. So now that he was said, you know, don't you see that I'm on the message of Allah and I'm busy and you know, I have to care for the affairs of the whole ummah. I have to care for the affairs of Dao. Only ask me for ask somebody else. You understand? Just to show love for the Prophet, how the message of Allah was a very humble man. It goes to show that he was not arrogant, rather he was someone, just a regular a person that aided his people and aided individuals, of course, no matter what they were of status, whether they be rich or whether they be from the impoverished. He tried to aid them to the best of his ability, at least So he came with Mughif and he went to Barira. She said, Barira, don't you see your husband's tears? Basically, he wants to stay with you. So, Barira says, لا حاجة تليفي So it says in the narration, the mass message of Allah said, no, I'm just asking for you to go back to your husband if you can, if you go back to him. So Barira asked the message of Allah, هل تأمرني يا رسول الله Are you commanding me, O message of Allah? This shows the taqwa of Barira رضي الله عنه Allah. Are you commanding me, O message of Allah? He says, La bal ushibk. Inna ma hana mutawassil. There's another narration that says Inna ma hana shafir. There's another narration which says Inna ma hana shafir. And then another narration that says Bal ana ushibk. He says, well, he said, no. Rather, I'm just, I'm just a shafir. I'm just trying to resolve the situation. That's all. Ana shafir. I'm just trying to intercede to, to try to resolve the situation.
but I'm not commanding you to go back there. And it's another narration that says, but she, rather, I'm just trying to consult, I'm consulting, I'm trying to give consultation. So she said, La That's a shame. But it says, the narration, I have no need for. So she requested the what? The fasr, the dissolvement or normal of the what? Of the nikah. So Barira, at the, also at the same time, she also remained with Aisha radiallahu anha Allah in order to serve Aisha Umm al-Mu'mineen. So the hadith doesn't stop there. There's another benefit that a lot of Ahl-Ain extract from this narration. It says, في يوم من الأيام دخل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يريد الطعام فقدم فقدم له طعام ليس فيه لحم فقال ألم أرى البرمة على النار البرمة إلى من الفخار إلى الطين فقال يا رسول الله هذا لحم تصدق به على غيرها على غيرها والنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان لا يأكل الصدقة. There's another fa'id that was extracted from this narration before we move to the other ones because the other ones are really important and they're very beneficial. Where it says in the last part of the story of Barira, it's kind of long. There's a lot of benefits of Shredder. Where it says, one day, there was some food that was given to the, to the, to the Prophet of the house, the Aisha, of course. The Messenger of Allah wanted to eat. So, they presented to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, food that didn't have any meat in it. They didn't have any lahm in it. The Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mentioned this, said, Alam al-nar. Alam ala burma ta'ala al-nar Then I'm not see the burma The burma is like a container from, of clay Which usually is cooked in it meat So why was he saying this? He says basically I see There was a container used to cook meat And as if someone was cooking meat So it was to so show the Prophet So he said meat Meat So Ya Rasulullah Had al This meat was given as charity to Barira. To Suddiqa bihi ala Barira. was given as charity to Barira. So the Prophet, and the Prophet Sallallahu however, did used to eat Sadaqa. He did used to eat charity, from the charity that was given or donated. Nor the Zakah, nor did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to take from the money of Zakah, nor from voluntary type of donations. And I think everyone who has the slightest understanding of fit understands why this was legislated. Why? Because the enemies of Islam can never use against the Prophet ﷺ and his messenger said shit that he was what chasing money. They could never use that against him because he never accepted it. So that was from the legislation to show that he didn't what want dunya. He just wanted the people to be what guided. So he did used to take what. The sadaqa, and he didn't used to take the zakah, and he didn't used to take also the tawar. But that was from the actual benefits of why this was legislated for him, specifically, alayhi salatu wasalam, that they used to take sadaqa. So, like we said, so the enemies of Islam can never say that, oh, he was just a, a man that wanted money, he wanted wealth, he wanted beautiful women. Even when we get to the hadith of why he married non wives, it was all out of. Specific reasons in which another refutation was made against those who say, see, he married nine women. He was all, he was a person that was, that was, he was very, he's a person that was, the, uh, uh, what do you call him? Hmm? Well, he was a lustful man. He wanted all these women. Because you know, you'll find them from the enemies of Islam to say this. That refutation is in another narration that was in the paper. Where he says, if the message of Allah was lustful, where he wanted just a group of women, as we're going to talk about, inshallah, then he would have married all virgins. Because we know back during the time of the Arab, as they preferred that the most beloved of women that they wanted was virgins. It was known during their time that the most, that, that the people desired the most was virgins. And he had the choice. And the only virgin he married was who? Aish. The rest of his wives were all married before. All of them were thayyibat. As we'll talk about, inshallah. And he says, and if he was lustful, he could have had those, just married a whole bunch of virgins, and that's it. But he only married one virgin who was just what? Aisha. Due to the fact, which showed that the message of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Arab preferred virgins. Where he came to Jabba, 
رضي الله عنه أن جابر الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم سأل جابر بن عبد الله سأله هل تزوجت بكرة هل تزوج قال نعم أو مسجد الله he said yes I'm married yeah I became or I became married then he says هل لا تزوجت بكرة تضاعبك وتضاعبها تضاحك تضاحكك وتضاحبها وتضاحبها وتضاحكك عفوا هل تضاعبك وتضاعبها وتضاحكك وتضاحكها he says why you you should have married a virgin so, so this narration to show that mer- the virgins were more what preferable don't you marry a virgin she plays with you you play with her you make her laugh you make him laugh, she makes you laugh so what was the more this what was more preferable and more desirous as far as the the out of that time was what virgins and the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't marry except what one so but what was preferable was that and he had the choice he wanted to marry all what virgins but he didn't you'll find in that same narration that there was different reasons of why he had married to gather between different tribes and different families and why he married nine women? Why he died when he married nine? Of course, when he died, he had nine. And why he married them for those different reasons, which we'll talk about, inshallah. That's not to go and show, and that's not now trying to make sound like the Lord. That's not also now to say, that if a man wanted to marry four, that it has to be for a reason. That's not the reason. That's not the case. You understand, everyone? I do hear some women, they try to say that. The Messenger of Allah, they married now because there was reasons behind it. So that's the reason why you should marry only four. You're going to be so lustful. No. That's the, what the Prophet did. Is now the same reason of why a man, for example, can marry two, two or three or four. And we'll talk about that in another time, inshallah. But just to refute the enemies of Islam, that they try to say that he was a lustful man and he married all these women to the end of it. As we know from the Sunnah of all the Prophets, all of them practice what? Religion. From the time of, like we said, starting from the time of Nuh, all the way up to Suleiman, all the way up to Dawood, to Musa, and we know that in, uh, and also likewise, Isa, when he comes back, which we'll talk about, inshallah, at a later time, as we know, Musa had more than one wife, and also likewise, uh, excuse me, Ibrahim had more than one wife, Suleiman had a whole lot of wives and concubines. Like we said, the practice of polygyny is a matter that was known. It was known since the beginning of time. It was something that was the norm. Of getting married to more than one woman was something norm. Women knew it. It was something normal, acceptable in society. Now, these days of times, in this so-called imperialism, where everything now is disgusting is good, but everything that's known and wholesome is flipped as disgusting. So homosexuality and having 10, 20, 30, 20, 50 girlfriends and boyfriends and going through and practice and being sexually involved with 10, 20, 30 people before you get married, or, for example, a man being intimate with 60 or 400 women to the point he can't even remember the count. And then, likewise, you have women now these days and times are so nasty, they can't even remember the count of how many men they have sex with. That's acceptable. That's acceptable. A man getting married to more than one woman is filthy and disgusting. Are you serious? So we say, in regards to this, what happened with Burira. So Burira had came and gave the what? The, uh, the, excuse me, the meat that the Prophet said that the container was cooked in. The meat was in there and he was trying to figure out the meat. Of course, he didn't take the sadaqah. However, listen to what the narration says. It says, Hua alayha sadaqah wa lana hadith. This was given charity to who? Burira. So we know that the Prophet ﷺ and Aisha was un, uh, Barira was under the care of his wife, Aisha, or she was servicing his wife, Aisha. She was servicing her. So it says in the narration, this meat was given to who Barira, Sadaqa. So then the Messenger of Allah, when he seen that at that time, this is when he ate from the meat. When he said in the narration, where it says, Who are they a sadaqa or they have sadaqa? Who are they a hadida? It was given as charity to her, but it is a gift for us. So for this, is from the barakat, the blessings of this woman, Barira. 
that we instructed this fiqh or this sunnah that if a person owns, for example, something, that whoever that he has something in his possession and he owns it, that he can actually own something or take in the ownership, of course, directly it wasn't halal for him, but due to some other type of way outside or from the, the aspect of an angle, something that's outside, then he can what? He can acquire it, or it can become something at that degree he can conduct in that thing, or he can utilize it. Even though directly, it's something that's not permissible. But due to the fact that on the side of where the matter or the actual affair is not connected with him directly, then it can what? If the thing is not haram, of course. The thing is not in unlawful. Because a lot of people will think that they want that that which is the aim or the actual thing, if it's unlawful, then it's not permissible at all. For example, for example, a person, oh, for example, it's not permissible for a person to own khamar. Then, for example, due to the fact that it might belong to his sister, or it might belong to his, his daughter, or, or something, or something to the side, or let's drink some khamar, la. The actual ain is, is it permissible, so that's what it's not permissible also likewise to give it as a gift to anyone. Or utilize it or conduct in it whatsoever. It's not permissible. You can't give it away, you can't sell it, you can't utilize it, you can't make money off of it, anything. And you can't even give it to a kafir either. You give it away, break it, pour it down the drain. As far as giving it to something in the garden, the push, I think they use it, the fertilizer, something like that. But anyway. To get or to destroy it or pour it down the drain or what have you. So if the khamar was given to you, then it's not for you to conduct it whatsoever. You can't give it to anyone, nor can you conduct it. Also, likewise, if someone was to steal some money and he wanted to give it as a gift to somebody, so he stole some money, then he gave it as a gift. Is it permissible to do that? We said, well, this type of behavior is also likewise Allah. Due to the fact that the money now or the actual the acquisition of this money is what is Allah, so it's not permissible. This is a question now. Is it we know that it's permissible for a hur or a woman who's a, a woman who's liberated free to be married to a what? To, to a slave. Fine. What if, what if now we know that the, once the woman becomes free, liberated, for example, the husband is still a slave, we know that she has the choice. Right, everyone? We already talked about steps. She has the alternative. She can stay with them or if request or what? She can request an annulment. Fine. What about now? Let's reverse the situation. What if the husband is free and she's a slave? Does she still have the choice? For example, he was a slave. They both were slaves. He has his freedom, but she still is a slave. Because she still requests her freedom. Mm -hmm. Okay, she can request a fessor. I don't think so. I'm going to even to me as this he says. Listen. He says, now we have a question. He says, now the woman or the Emma I'm sorry, everyone. Let me re re uh, reiterate the question. I'm sorry. If the Emma, if the actual female slave becomes free under a man that's already free, that's the question. Does she have the choice? 
you understand the question now? Let's say it again. إِذَا عَتَقَتِ الْأَمَا تَحْتَ حُرْ يَكُنُ لَهَا الْخِيَارِ Does she have the choice? Exactly. طيب, so what you say? Can she or can she? She can? He said she don't think she can. What do you think, Mahir? A woman became free under a man who was liberated was free. She was a slave, but she became free now. So she now they're the same level. Huh. What do you think? She don't think she can. What do you say, Azad? Huh? So whatever. We say. Oh, the entity. I I come here. I say he's a I do. It's whatever. You know what I'm saying. But anyway, basically they're the same level now. She was a slave. First he was liberated. She, he was free. She was a concubine. She has her freedom, so now they're at the same level. So he says no. So he made Jensen. Plus, she can't ask. Still, regardless. Okay. Fight. That's what we find. Number one, we say this. إذا كانت تحت العبد of course, we know that she was freed and her husband's slave. That's clear, right? Right, everyone? It's clear. She can have the choice. She has the choice to either what? Stay with her or leave. Right. <laughs> لكن إذا عتقت تحت حور هل يمكن الأمة أن تتزوج حورا؟ However, if the woman now was liberated under a man who was free to a liberated person He says, can she now marry a man that's liberated? Can she now marry a man that's liberated? We say, of course, number one is, yes She can marry a man that's what? Can a woman who's a slave, of course, we know that that's permissible. There's a lot to do with the other mentions, of course, in his, in his book about for, for the person who cannot marry, for example, or does not have the ability financially, or he doesn't have the ability to marry a, a woman who's a hur, a hurra, or liberated woman, then he can marry a what? Or he can marry a what? A um. What the conditions? Number one, the first conditions is that he doesn't have the ability to give us a mahar to a woman who's liberated or free. That's number one. Number two, that the, the emma or the female concubine has to be a mu'mina. She has to be a believer. She can't be a woman of the book, no other than a woman of the book. If he marries her. If he marries her. You say everyone? So that's number one. Uh, number two. Number three, of course, in the ayah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who also they, they fear anat. If you look to the tafsir of it, meaning those men who fear for themselves, fear for themselves falling into zina, falling into zina, so he's going to fall into fornication, and he doesn't have the ability. Then of course, then what? It's permissible for him to marry what? A emun. With these conditions. طيب. فإذا تزوج الحر جارية بيد الشروق ثم عتقت طيب. So now number one we establish that a, a concubine can marry a man who's what? Free. With these conditions. Of course the man, number one, doesn't have the ability to marry a woman who's liberated. Of course he doesn't have the ability financially or doesn't have the ability at all. And also likewise we said the second condition that has to be what? She has to be a mu'mina. A mu'mina. That she cannot be a what? A woman of the book, or other than a woman of the book. And secondly, like we said, that he fears that he's going to fall into zina. Khashat al anat wal anat al wukur fi muharram. That's one falling into what? What is Allah? Fine. So now, these shuruts are now being carried out and actualized. Now the woman becomes free. Now he marries this, she marries this man. Fine. So now, let's just say the woman. She's free. The one who's over her affairs freed her while she's married. Does she have the choice then? So that's going back to the initial topic. 
So, as Atish mentioned, it said what? Left. Twice. Doesn't matter. She's an Emma or not an Emma. She's not going anywhere. Right here. You understand? That just to quickly answer this question so we can move on to what I want to talk about today. He says that Qawr Rajah, of course, Ahl Ibn Yufan is a different as well. But that which is its strongest, he says, of course, in Mr. Uthami, as much as he says this, is that that which is strongest is to say that no, she doesn't have the choice. She doesn't have the choice. You understand? Of course, if it's due to a is, is reason or Islamic reason, we just talked about, for example, the woman now, I just feel today I don't want to be married today to this, 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 this man. So I'm just going to go to the court and all the marriage is done. Like we said. In that other case, yes. But here in this with your husband, now even at the same level, you cannot just request a what? Fest for a of the marriage, except, of course, due to a what? Legitimate reason. She has a, doesn't have the choice for that unless she has a what? A legitimate reason. For example, abuse or whatever. Or maybe he's not spending on her or he's not treating her kindly or He's abusing her with his tongue or what have you. That's something different. But we're talking about if she was a slave, if she was free, then she could just just get up one day and say, I'm, I'm good. You understand? But however, in this regard, even though she's free and, he's, and, they, and he, she's free and they were married, of course, then here in this instance, she doesn't have the, what, the choice. Unless it's what, like we said, unless it's a legitimate, justifiable reason, for requesting the khulah or fasq or dissolvement of the marriage. Like we said, we know fasq can be due to numerous reasons, as the end from the fuqaha mentioned. Whether it be abuse, or whether it be domestic abuse, or whether it be not uh, satisfying. A lot of people don't know this, but this could be a reason. Also, satisfying her intimately could be a reason. Yes, a lot of people don't know that. For example, he's not. Being intimate with her for long periods of time, two months, three months, for she's a human being. Women are human beings like men are human beings. You do this to her, then what? Then she has the, the actual reason to request a fesk. She has the reason. All these are what? Legitimate reasons. Well, for example, he might abuse her with his tongue. Some of our brothers may be able to out of rectify us and rectify them. Really are hard on them when they was. Talk to them in a very demeaning, foul manner. And likewise, we know that women do the same thing. I've seen some witness certain things the way women talk to their husbands. I'm just looking like, wow. <laughs> but these are things that what are not permissible, and there are reasons for what dissolvement of the, of the marriage contract. Understand, everyone? Right. So that we said, Yama Shadikhun. So, the Qawr al-Rajih, even if the Uthameen mentions it, says, عَلَى كُلِّ حَالَ قُلْ رَاجِحِ أَنَا الْأَمَا إِذَا عَدَّقَتْ تَحْتَ زَوْجِهَا لِكَانَ حُرًّا فَلَا خِيَارَ لَهَا فَلَا خِيَارَ لَهَا وَإِكَانَ عَبْدًا فَلَهَا الْخِيَارَ So if a woman becomes free, or she's under, of course she's married, if she becomes free, if she's, the, if now he's the liberator or a free person, then of course, then she doesn't have the what? The choice. Just to get up one day and say, I'm out. I want to go to the Islamic courts and know if our marriage is done. And the husband says, please stay with me. If he's a, he's a hout, then she has the choice. Nothing he can do. You understand? Know However, if she's free, then he's, if she became free, then what? She doesn't have the what? The choice. But however, like we said, due to the hadith of the Prophet, he celebrated, she said, Ayyatuma, Marta, Tala. There's another narration that says, Just that women know this and hear this narration. It says, Any woman that requests a talaq without doable excuse or justifiable, that which can tell the sunnah, that she will not smell the fragrance of paradise. So that you know that asking for a khulaq or, or asking for divorce in a khulaq without a legitimate excuse. What comes as a result of it is not smelling the fragrance of paradise. So let the women know that to make sure that it's a justifiable reason, of course. And we know justifiable reasons, what we mentioned, examples of domestic abuse or not being treated kindly or being deprived of not being taken care of 
or for example, not being satisfied intimately, maybe. All these are different reasons why a woman can have so festive. But it's just for example, just out of because she's an evil, bitter woman, she's just I don't like you, I'm gonna be out just because I'm I'm better than you, you have you make I'll make more money than you, and you're less than me, and all that those reasons are the reasons, then like we said, the best this is when the hadith applies. You understand everyone? This is when the hadith or actually the hadith what applies. And I don't understand for us for the likes of me and the Amri, why are we as Muslims we start to think we're better than people when as far as looking down upon people. That's what I mean. Being arrogant. No matter whether they be a person that's in, 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 of, of age, or for example, I'm younger, he's you're an old, played out woman. I've no, noticed that this happens in plural marriages for some odd reason. For example, a husband will marry a younger woman and a wife, the wife, the first wife will be older than the young or than the other wife, for example. So now the younger wife becomes Arrogance. You just an old job of prune, and I, I'm the new wife coming in to run things. And, I, and I, I really don't understand. Where do you get this mentality from? Where do you get this from? Where is this from? What will make you negate? And this is this is a nasiha of the sisters. And I tell sisters this all the time. When you come into a marriage with a, with a man, he's already has a family. Just come in there with sincere intentions. That's it. And Allah will give you my kind of It's that simple. You come now in the marriage with evil intentions, being arrogant and looking down upon people and looking down upon people's families, then you get out of it what you get. And Allah will deal with you according to your intention. You intend evil, evil come right back on you. And I've seen it happen in so many situations. Sisters coming in, they're trying to so-called have this jaggedy mentality, I'm going to throw it on him, girl, and... I look like this, and you should see his wife, his wife look like this. You don't know why men love who they love. And just because he married you does not now negate that he doesn't love his first wife. He doesn't at all. Even though you might perceive in your sick mind that she's just an old job of poo. And then when you get thrown out the marriage because you intended evil, you're going to have your feelings hurt. Because you intended evil from the beginning. You understand, everyone? And this is a message to our sisters. If you just get married to another family, just have sincere intentions. Just be sincere. That's it. Want good and be sincere. Don't come in with intentions of, um, you know, she's dark, I'm light. She looked like this. I'm like, women, you don't do not know what's in women's men's chest of why they love or who they love. And people just love who they love. It's, it's not it's not in something controllable. You could be a beautiful woman, but you might look down on another woman. That man still love her more than you. You don't know why. That's something that Allah just put in the heart of the, the, the chest of people. You understand, everyone? It's not for you to know why. Just come into a marriage, one and good, and it's that soon. <laughs> you understand? Just come into a marriage, wanted to aid, wanted to help, wanted to build a family, wanted to grow the Ummah of Muhammad. Come in sincere intentions so we can all build together and, and we can build with these families. We can stop this trivial nonsense of this filth going on in our society, of these family structures being destroyed because of fornication and sin and homosexuality and all this other stuff, and build communities and families and get make them big so we can now groom and cultivate women and children that do not have these mental issues. You understand, everyone? So we can stop the, the, the cycle. But you're aided to the cycle by coming in because you're a person that had issues because you wasn't raised properly. So now you want to come now into this marriage, and I'm going to destroy it because you have this jagged mentality. I'm light-skinned. She's dark. She's an old woman. And I'm young, and I look like this. Sister, stop, stop with this. This is, this is pre-Islamic way of thinking. It's not, it's, not, it's not from our religion to think this way. Where do you get this from? We come in with good intentions to aid people and to help them and to and offer all of us to all grow together. We come in to aid one another. We don't come in to try to get out of it or I can get out of it and maybe snap. I'm going to take her man from her and I'm going to put it on him, girl. He probably never had the way I had. Because all these women out here think that way. They all think that it's a superficial, dumb mentality of thinking this way. And all of them say this. And, you, and I don't know what the majority of us in this room be laughing like, too. 
Are you serious? Seriously, because this is what goes on in our communities. And you women, you do this, come to this mentality, and the men are looking at you, you being set up. You setting yourself up for failure. Because like I said, you can throw him on all day. At the end of the day, if a man loves a woman, ain't nothing you'd be able to stop it. Even if you did do things correctly, so so called intimately with him. Person loves who he loves regardless. You can't sway a person just because of some intimacy. You understand, everyone? Some men's people are men out here get weak. Some of them, but some of them don't. No matter what you do. Yeah, some men out there do get a little weak, you know. There's, there's men out there that do get weak for due to those weak. Now, as with some men don't, they remain firm. Like, okay, you're good. That's good. I'm really not. But that's not at the end of the day. It's not at the end of the day. I love who I love. <laughs> you understand, everyone? That's good. How many love may all reward you? Islamically, yes, you will be rewarded. Yes. <laughs> it's the truth. It is. You'll be rewarded for that. May Allah reward you for satisfying your husband. Like Allah say. But at the end of the day, a person loves who he loves. You understand, everyone? That's the truth, though. Man, it is. Kitab Sunnah, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, clearly. He says, What in the people do in Ahadikum Sadaqa? So that's a narration for verily for one one of you to relieve his desires in a halal manner, you'll have a reward of sadaqah. You understand everyone? <laughs> so and also the woman will get the reward of pleasing her husband, because that's what she's supposed to do. You understand everyone? Oh, yeah. But like I said, these are the things why we're trying to remove this type of mentality from our sisters out here. And, and, and some of the brothers. Also, because you brothers don't, nobody online think that I'm just coming at the sisters, because I did talk about the brothers a couple of minutes ago. I said how they hard speak harshly to their wives, and talk ill to them, and speak in, 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 in a very demeaning type of manner. I've said all of that. So nobody says I was one-sided in the, in the lecture as I've been accused of. You understand, everyone? So, for like I said in regards to this, so we say, and to our brothers and sisters, these mentalities and these things have to be what? Rectified. If you have marry a family and come in, and also likewise, brothers, when you want to marry these women, marry with sincere intentions too. Do not come in with the intention that, you know, she's just, you know, you can tell she's just a, you know, a little play doll. If you want to marry the woman, marry that with sincere intentions. Sincere intentions and be clear and frank of what you want before you marry. And likewise, the woman, come in with sincere intentions. Do not come in with evil. We know the qaida in which we know we learned in fiqh. It says, Allah is going to deal with you to kill against your evil niya that you have. Allah is going to deal with you to kill against your evil niya that you have. You'll come in being evil, thinking you're going to turn somebody out. You come out being what? Turned out. You understand? You come in trying to say, I'm going to now, I'm going to hurt this family, I'm going to hurt these people, I'm going to hurt these upright people, you come out being what turned out and being feelings hurt and you're feeling bad. Is it clear, everyone? So all the, just to sum up everything, just be an upright individual. It's that simple. Yeah. Five, the next hand, what time is it? What time is it? Okay. Just come in, also likewise, come into these marriages with what? Humbleness. That's the main thing. Us as Muslims, and I don't understand, a lot of us, we learn these classes, the Aqida. The first thing of what completes your Tawheed is to relieve yourself of arrogance. I don't, I don't understand why we still, as Muslims, we're a lot of us, are still, we look down upon people. When you learn to actualize Tawheed from the usul of it, is that you rid yourself of arrogance in all those aspects. You're not looking down upon people. No matter what of their, of their status, financially, or their color, or ethnicity, skin, weight, whatever, hair texture, you can't look down on any more age. Do you see old, I'm old, younger? All this is jahili and nonsense. Where do we get this stuff from? You understand, everyone? Jahili way of thinking. And a lot of us don't realize that's, that's jahili as it is. 
looking down upon somebody due to their weight, their color, their hair texture, their ethnicity, their background, their country they come from. Where do you get this from? This is not from the slave. Where do you get it from? Something is filthy. Anyway, so the next hadith, I said any rate, not any way. At any rate, the next narration says about the Haq and the Fayruz of Thayyid. The next narration of the Haq and the Hajj mentions it says, عن الضحاك بن فيروز الديلمي عن أبيه رضي الله عنه قال قلت يا رسول الله إني أسلمت وتحتي أختان فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم طلق أيتهما شدة رواه الضاح والقرب عند النساء وصحيح من أحباء وذا القبر من بيحق وأعله بخاري الضحاك بن فيروز الديلمي عن الفاضة فيروز قال to Ya Rasulullah, verily I became Muslim. This is what he says. I became Muslim and I have under me, meaning I'm an authority over, you know, I'm married to women who are two sisters. Two sisters. He didn't marry them after he became Muslim, he married before he was what? Muslim. Before he was Muslim. The call of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, divorce which one of the two you want. Divorce one of the which one of the two that you want. From the affairs of Jahiliya, that the Magians, the Magians, the I think fire worshippers, the Majus. How do you translate Majus, brothers? Or Magians, fire worshippers. That they used to marry their Mahadim. It was filthy and nasty. That they used to marry their, their Mahadim. They used to marry their mothers. They used to marry their daughters, they used to marry their sisters, these sisters. They used to do these type of things. Now, still to these days, some we know here in this country is some people, who is it? The uh the Mormons? I think there's a sect that they're for them that they're married, they try to keep the so called so called way of keeping their lineage pure, so they keep it in the family, which is which we know Islamically is filthy. Fight. So it says, the Prophet ﷺ told that he had to divorce one of them who he, who the person was. Fine. This hadith, of course you know that Bukhari mentioned it said, number one, that it has a illah, that it has a hidden weakness. So, inshallah ilayhi Bukhari, fa'inahu yantabak ayat al-wa'i al-shabi'i. However, he says it does apply and it is applicable and it is correct. This is what he mentions, it says about this. To the Qawaid of the Shara'ah, Kitab the Sunnah, and it does agree with it due to his other narration that hates this. And there's an ayah that talks about where Allah to bring up the other sisters book, that you gather between two sisters, except that which was what that has already preceded or that which transpired before. The meaning of the ayah, of course, is we're going to talk about that after a person becomes Muslim, and he has under them two sisters, there are two sisters, then of course it's upon him to what? He has to divorce one of them. It's not permissible for you to what? Remain married to both sisters. It's not permissible for to be, may, remain married to both of those sisters, and he'll have to divorce one of them. In the Ma'qad Salaf, which we talked about, meaning there's no sin upon him after he became, of course, Muslim. Now, what's the, the issue is, is the marriages recognized and acceptable that was done in Jahiliyyah after after Islam. That's the question we're going to talk about next week. Not now. <laughs> As we'll talk about, inshallah, how the religion does honor, respect marriages prior to the religion. Prior to the religion, except that if it was done in a way, from, except that if the actual matter or the affair of the marriage is something that it goes against the religion or opposes it, for example, of what we just mentioned now. The man got married to two sisters. So now he became Muslim. This is binding upon him to what? Divorce one. But notice, but notice in the hadith, the Prophet did not say, He didn't say, marry her again. He didn't say that. So even though he's upon kufr, Islam still recognized their what? The validity of the marriage. It just didn't recognize the actual act of what he did. You understand? He didn't say, mention the narration, get married again, your contract was what? Bible. You understand? He didn't say that. 
recognized the marriage even though they were upon what? Kufar. But he just, like he said, he just rejected the act of what he did after he was Muslim by being married to two women. Also, the example of that is the Hadith of Ghaynad, the Salaf, as we will talk about, it's coming, inshallah. So he's married to what? Married to ten women. He's married to ten. So Prophet Sallallahu said to him, what? Divorce six, huh? Keep four. Notice the Messenger of Allah didn't say that Anna Narish and Khaynan ibn Salama marry those four again. Because before you got married in Jahiliyyah, it's not what? Recognized. You understand? He still recognized the marriage as it being a what? A sound marriage. All he did was that the act of being married to ten women was what? Impermissible. So he told them to what? Verse six, keep, keep four. So it's, 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 if he's saying we reckon Islamically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes that marriage, even though it was in the state of Quran. But however, this act goes against of what you can profess of being Muslim now. And you when you profess to be a Muslim, that means that everything Allah set down has to be what? Has to be actualized, has to be practiced. So from that, what Allah has mentioned it says. It's impermissibly be married to these multiple women at one time. But still, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still recognize the marriage. You understand? Now, as far as a lot of, so a lot of, a lot of people who try to say, we'll talk about this later, the Muslims that now go down to the courts, we'll talk about that later. The Muslims that go to the courts and get married. No, once you become Muslim, now have you performed the marriage the Muslim way. You're Muslim now, so now it has to be done in the Muslim method. Understand, everyone? Once you become Muslim, it has to be done in the Muslim method. It has to be done in the way that, that Allah commands that marriage what takes place. Now, as for example, if you did it before, as I'll talk about that ex one of the, and this is years ago, it's 12 years ago. Sheikh Salah Suhaimi, but this is years ago. It's about maybe 12 years ago. As I have was sitting next to him, he even mentioned this. He said, Islam recognizes the marriage that was done before in Jahiliyyah. Let's just say a person got married to Christianity. Then both of them became Muslim. He says, Islam doesn't look for the what? The affairs of whether or not how they were married, depending on that type of religion of disbelief. The only thing that's looked at is the actual what? The marriage or whether or not they do something unlawful that goes against the religion. That's what's looked at. But if it's two Muslims now, then what? It has to be done in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded for both of them to get married. Do you? Is it clear? There's a lot of people who these days do some strange things. Not due to, I'm talking about due to ignorance. A lot of people don't know. It's a shame these misogynists, these deviant sex out here. Akhi Allah Musta'ala, may Allah Tawbah Ta'ala either guide them or Allah Musta'ala. That's the only thing I can say. Fine. Any questions? Stop here. Allah Musta'ala, 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 Allah <laughs> Can somebody stop the machine for me? Is that, is that okay? huh? No, they. I said they married a Mahadim. So Mahra. Mahra. No, I just said that they, uh, they married a Mahadim. The hell it was in Mahra. What's going on, man? I'm the You know how to stop this thing? Stop. This one?